Once upon a time, a young princess fell in love with a stable boy and became with child. They fled their homeland and took shelter in a faraway cave. The king tracked them down and killed the stable boy. The princess, in her grief, took her father's knife and stabbed herself. She died and became the mountain. Her child would dwell forever inside her. This is the myth of the mountains where the Tam Luang Caves are found. It is in these caves on June the 23rd, 2018, that a youth soccer team, the Wild Boars, and their coach were to visit. Inside the caves, they are cut off by flash floods and trapped a thousand meters below the surface, deep inside the mountains of Chiang Rai. An international rescue mission, like no other, commences. It will last for 18 days. One Thai Navy SEAL, Saman Gunan, will tragically lose his life. With time running out, two British divers, Rick Stanton and John Volaton, will ultimately reach the kids and nations around the world will celebrate their heroism. But theirs is only part of the story and perhaps not even the biggest part. Who were the divers who found a way through the deadly maze of sunken caverns and narrow passageways, forging the path that led to the rescue? Who were these unsung heroes who pressed on when others, including the two British divers, had lost hope? These are the men who did the impossible while the world held its collective breath. This is their story. I thought, yeah, it's probably gonna be, you know, two or three days top, then we should be able to get to the boys. I got a call from Pei. Uh, Pei's a longtime friend of mine. And uh, he just asked me if I would, if I would want to go up to the rescue. And I, I just, I, he, I got the next flight out. Uh, when I got up there, we just started right from there going into the, into the cave. And while we were working in there, sitting in there, and, and, and we can hear the rumbling noise. I mean, it's like a really loud thunder. Uh, imagine the, the, the sound of like a, a waterfall, really big, big waterfall that coming in. We can actually hear its echo inside the cave. It was just rain, 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 rain. It just nonstop rain. But we were in chamber three, and actually the water started rising almost all the way to the third chamber already. It's really big, huge chamber that they used to uh, set up as the base camp inside the cave. Everybody had to evacuate out of, out of the chamber three, all of the Navy SEALs and everything. We evacuated out of chamber three and everybody out of the cave. This is, you know, not what I was thinking at all. It's not gonna be easy two or three day job. I was preparing to go on a holiday to Philippines with my wife, a uh, diving holiday. My bag was almost packed until I heard the news that there was a young soccer team trapped in a cave up north in, uh, in Chiang Rai. Uh, there was very little information available at the time. And two days later, I had heard that two British cave divers that, are, that I know, they're quite well known in the community, showed up to help. So I figured that's fine. Too many cooks in the kitchen is not always good. So. Um, It'll be fine, they'll get them out. That's when, uh, on Wednesday, actually the UK team, John and Rick arrived on that night as well with Robert. They tried to go in on the same night, but uh, I believe they, they couldn't get too far because it was really bad condition at that time. The water flow is too high, they couldn't push through and it's really zero visibility. I got a phone call from Pei, a friend of mine who has close connections with the uh, Navy SEALs. He says, the cooperation isn't going as we had liked. Could you mind to come and support the, the Thai Navy SEALs in, in the cave diving? Uh... Basically, he dropped everything and come in and, and help. Once he arrived in late Thursday afternoon, that's when uh, I start talking to Navy SEALs and see, OK, Ben brought his rebreather equipment. And that means we can actually penetrate in farther, longer than the regular air tank. So I showed up there, and I was immediately driven to the cave. The first minute, I'm like, wow, this is stunning. It's, it's a, it is a really beautiful cave in a not-so-happy situation. And then I saw the water, which was resembled a Colorado River. Brown mud just under high force coming out of the cave. And my initial thought, there's no way. This, this will never work. 
and I asked him how do you have a map of the cave? Yeah, we have a 30-year-old map drawn by the French and there's a British dry caving specialist here, he can give you some information, but other than that, we know nothing. My next question was, has, has anybody ever dived this cave? And nobody had ever dived this cave. And of course, I've quickly found out why, because it was really dangerous conditions. The current, lack of visibility, entanglement, small restrictions, not very human friendly. It's already a, a big challenge in dry conditions, crawling, but in diving, it was out of the question. I had very little hope for the, for the kids, and this, this, sounds, this doesn't sound very nice, but they had no guarantee the kids were still alive. And secondly, they didn't know where, where they could be kids. There was pure speculation that they could be on this spot because they know that this spot stays dry during the monsoon when the whole cave fills up with water. Children tend to survive longer than adults in, in extreme exposure conditions, as long as they don't panic. So that guarantee I didn't have. So I'd like to, I wanted to keep an open mind, but I didn't want to turn it into a suicide mission. And I always have a personal sort of score chart. The moment three red flags go up, I turn around. I was expecting the British divers to be there and work together, but they're a small group that prefers to dive by themselves, and that's what they were doing. They were going in and out by themselves and stick to themselves. So uh, I was asked to join the Navy SEALs, who had no cave techniques or no cave equipment, uh, and if I wanted to assist and, and point them in the right direction. Pay and myself, we spent time training the Navy SEALs. Training was some of the most important things that I thought they would need to know. Me and Bruce can actually help prep them and teach them the basic safe way in the cave diving. What is the hand signal, uh, how to tie the rope properly. You can't just lay a line. There's a proper way to do things. You can lay a line and actually kill yourself if you're not paying attention to what you're doing. I had prepared all my gases and prepared my rebreather and the tanks. And I was guided in together with the Navy SEALs. And to get to Camp 3 took me already two and a half hours. That's about the farthest you could actually go where there's, you know, where you could set up a base camp, like the chamber and stuff like that. Walking into to this giant mouth, it's like a giant monster, really. The cave is tapered, so the entrance is, is enormous. And then as you go in further and further, it gets more narrow, more narrow until you're really crawling through small restrictions. But there, uh, once you pass through the entrance, it's nothing, it's, it's natural walking. So all the jagged rock, all muddy, you have to climb up and down. Getting the chamber through, you know, it, it was not so much diving, because it was actually only a couple of sumps, but it was a lot of hiking through the mud, up and down inside the cave, going through smaller passageways. It wasn't easy, but it was actually diving-wise, there was only just a couple of small sumps. The diving really didn't start until you got up there. So they were guiding me in, and the Navy SEALs, they, they, these are fit. So they were quite fast, much faster than I am. I was also dragging with me two cylinders and a rebreather. I was top of my physical limits, so to say. You actually have to um, turn to the side. You can't actually walk straight down. You have to turn to the side and slip feet first and then go duck up and, you know, so it's very hard to get through. I regularly run. I consider myself reasonably fit, but this was a different ball game. I later found out there was a high amount of carbon dioxide in the, in the rooms and a low oxygen levels, which made it feel like climbing a 4,000 meter high mountain. Anyway, so we're not just climbing, it was intermittent with sumps. Sumps are um, like siphons where you crawl through, high flow, no visibility at all. And then it was climbing again in very hot and, and humid rooms, which made you lose a lot of fluids uh, by sweating. And then again in pretty cold water fighting through it. So it, it was almost like a, a military circuit, so to say. Actually, once you go in, pass through the second chamber, there's a one side. In Thai, it's said Thang Lam Bak. Thang Lam Bak means it's dangerous. Basically, they not recommend for you to go in because some of the area, you actually have to hop over. Otherwise, it will. if you look down, it's very steep, and you might if you fall down, you definitely die but they still open up for tourists to go in there, actually. Uh, so by the time you get to Camp 3, you're already well exhausted. Two and a half hours of constant labor and dragging your equipment through muddy rocks. I didn't never expect it. Normally you go at a slow pace, but I know after one and a half kilometer, I was barely in half of the, uh, the end goal that I needed to reach. To say I got a bit demotivated already would be an understatement. 
So, and then the actual diving had to happen. I asked the Navy SEALs who were collecting cylinders there and ropes. I said, so where is the diving? And they pointed at me to a small, muddy puddle with a whirlpool in the middle. And that's when all my hope sank. I, I look at this, and it's like this giant cup of cappuccino you've just stirred around. It's like this, this, this Deadpool pulling you in. So, um, of course, I didn't want to show my disappointment to the Navy SEALs. They had all their hopes on me. Here's this professional cave dive who's going to show us how things are done. High pressure on you, physically, mentally as well, because they're all looking at you like you're going to save the kids. Uh, I was diving alone, mainly because the Navy SEAL had no cave techniques, and they were on a single tank, which limits the, their reach. So I went alone. First time, I had a big, a big reel with me, with a one millimeter cave line, as we call it, and you always lay a line. That's the main rule in cave diving. You always lay a line back to safety. So I started with that in zero visibility, basically using the current, feeling my way around the cave, and it was an absolute disaster. I got stuck multiple times. Navy SEALs had laid a communication cable and electrical cable to provide a communication link to the, to the kids, and of course that was now all over the place. There was fire hoses that were connected to the water pumps, so everything was left in a hurry when the second flood happened. So I became entangled in those lives at least a dozen times, and being alone and not being able to see doesn't increase your self-confidence, to say the least. Still, I managed to go ahead with that, and I guess after about 150 meters, red flags were going up everywhere. I had ripped my suit, so water was coming into my dry suit. I had crushed my, my dive computer, so I had no idea about depth or time. My hands were being cut, off, cut up on, the, on those rocks, so I was not the most happy diver at that moment. And it's mainly the part where I got stuck uh, with my belly against the bottom and my back against the rocks, trying to push myself through a restriction. I got narrower and narrower up to the point where I needed to fully exhale to get myself through and I'm never going to get out of this. The restriction was maybe a foot high, 30 centimeters high, so but of course these kids, they're, they're quite small, so they would have gone through their in dry conditions quite easily. So regardless, I, I pushed through and as I came on the other side of the restriction, I felt the, a flow reversal. Now. As a cave diver, you always start a cave dive against the flow, that if stuff goes wrong or you turn around, you can exit with the flow. Now, you wouldn't continue diving uh, with the flow, what, because where flow is, it can increase and you're being sucked in into a place you don't want to be. Yeah? So that's when the third red flag went up. This is, if we're going to continue on this, I need thicker line than my one millimeter nylon cave line. After 150 meters, this is suicidal and, uh, and I turned around. So when I came back, when I surfaced back in chamber three, I was by myself, which uh, I felt pretty alone at that stage. I'd been gone for quite some time, but I had no idea how long because my computer was, was cracked, flooded. So I started walking back, pretty depressed. And when I got back to the restriction between camp three and two, I met the two British divers who were go going back in to try another time. I says, how, how did it go? I'm like, it's a suicide. Uh, I got entangled, uh, there's a flow, of, can't see anything, and look at me and say, yeah, that's exactly the impression we had. We can't dive in these conditions where people will die. I'm like, yeah, I have to agree with you. And they're like, well, shall that be the statement we bring back to the commander? I can't lie about it, it is, it is really too dangerous. Uh, so I came out after roughly eight hours in the cave, was brought to the commander, the admiral, and uh, it was like, so how did it go? I'm like, well, he says, yeah, I just saw the British and they reported that it's, it really is too dangerous. And they are stopping the, the, the search activities. He says, do you agree? I'm like, yes, it is. It is too dangerous. I had to turn around because my equipment broke and it is really, with the equipment I have right now, it is too dangerous. Okay, he thanked me, said, thank you for your bravery and I appreciate what you're doing. And I totally understand. So there's no pressure at all. It's, uh, the time people thank you for trying and risking your life. One day I was at the work. In the morning I see uh, the news. And uh, in the news I see there's the child who is trapped in the cave and the rescue situation is uh, it's terrible. Two hours later, I received the message from Ben and he described for me the situation like critical. And I prepare my equipment, kiss my son, kiss my wife and go to the airport. 
I stay until the morning in one hotel what I find. Then morning, uh, Seva he joined me too. I think it was on uh, 29 of June. So I have a rubber flight in, uh, in the morning of 29 and get to Chennai then with a taxi to the resort where Max was. And at this time, the guys was at the cave. Uh, no phone, no, no any contact with them. By the way, we meet there the prime minister who is go out from the cave. Say hello. He stopped like, oh, hello, guys. <laughs> it was Thai prime minister. Mm, yeah. <laughs> then we meet the Ben. He say, oh, guys, great. At least somebody can help me. <laughs> in, in these expeditions, uh, whether it's climbing or diving, there's always the, the tendency to be, it's easy to be convinced to try again. So I'm like, okay, before I go out, before I go in again, I need to change some of my equipment to a different suit and this and this and this. But mainly, I need thicker rope. I need a really thick rope all the way to the kids to, in case there's a flow reversal, uh, rescuers can pull themselves out. Yeah, not with the conventional small cave line, which would just snap if you try and pull yourself uh, out of it. Moreover, you don't just buy three kilometers of thick cave line in 7-Eleven. I knew this was not on site, and I was hoping to buy some time, A, to find a solution, an alternative entrance, or that the water levels would drop a bit, because I still thought it was absolute suicide. And I thought, okay, I, I, I win some time with this, which helped because the next day, I said, okay, no diving, we're just getting this line together and stuff. But the day after that, Surprise, surprise, four kilometers of thick red rope arrived together with a lot of caving equipment, helmets, lights, you wouldn't believe. So the, the amount of equipment donated was mind blowing. And when I came back to the control post, to the command post, the Navy SEALs were putting big rice bags uh, full of, uh, each bag contained 200 meters of these thick red rope and they were pulling it inside the cave already. So I went to the Admiral and I says, what's going on? The, the Navy SEALs are diving. I thought we agreed that it was too dangerous. He looked at me and it's like, Ben, I appreciate what you and, and the other ones have been doing, but I can't tell the Thai people that we're giving up on, on, on the kids. So, and these Navy SEALs, they are trained for this. They're willing to sacrifice their life to um, at least try and, and get to the kids. So at that point, something changed for me because like I said, we had very little hope that we would ever get to the kids. But there was an agreement that if we are diving, the Thai Navy SEALs would not dive to avoid confusion and obstruction inside the cave. So I told Maxim, shall we dive? Because if we are diving, the Navy SEALs are not diving. So it was more preservation for the Navy SEALs rather than having very high hopes to actually find the kids. Okay, child, small, skinny, no food. The water is contaminated. Uh... It's already a day in the, in the in the cave. It's very difficult to survive. We don't know what we can find. We this can be died. And it's just like you know, you ha there's a rescue always uh, takes a turn. You know, when does a rescue become a recovery? Highest reason for people to die in the caves. It's when the cave is flooded. So, if to be honest, I was thinking that we are going to recover bodies. On 30th of June, we got the permission from the Navy SEALs to go to the chamber three and see how the condition in the cave there. Uh, if we can try to explore more. The first day that we actually have somewhat a full team of the experienced cave diver. Bruce was there to help with the consultant, prepare the tanks and the mixed gas and everything. I was there as the, the coordinator and the dive supervisor. And then we have Ben, Maxim, Silva and Group A to, to be a diver. So we gear up, start to push ourselves through the first sump. And as soon as we pass the first sump, we get inside the first dry chamber. I was like, uh, Max, where is the pore? And he said, I have no idea. Yes, we have uh, it was many experienced diver who is try to go there, but condition is not favorable. It's dangerous, it's critical. It's not maybe physics, it's more psychological. So the problem of the guys who is try to reach the chamber three is stop or rest a little bit. And when you rest, you change your mind. Yeah, for Max it was 
it looks like it was more easy for him. So his military background and maybe uh, more physically fit for this one. He was like, okay, let's go, let's go. <laughs> I was like, okay, Max, Max, wait, wait. But just give me a minute. I have to chill a little bit. <laughs> I say for Seva, if you have a mission, never stop. Slowly and you can reach. So Maxim and Ben was the, the only two that actually reached to the third chamber. I get with me four air tank, 70% of the cave, you must to climb in with all this uh, equipment. I must to do one chamber three or four times for travel all my equipment. For Ben, it's not easy to have only two tanks and it's go one way, but I need to take my two tanks, carry to the entrance of other chamber, back to this chamber and uh, transport all my equipment to the chamber three. Now, I've known Matt Sims for about a decade. He came as a student to do, start doing cave diving and technical diving, and he has done a lot of training and he developed to a very reliable cave instructor. With him on my side, I felt a little bit more confident that we could actually pull this off. Um, it's not easily faced or easily chickens out when things get spicy. The neighbor seals had very carefully put 200 meters of line of this rope in, in rice bags, and there was this wall. It was all laid out in Camp 3, and then I started realizing that this is a lot of rope. Together with a mountain of uh, scuba cylinders and other supplies, these bags are huge, and dragging these bags in front of you against the current, like, wow, this is gonna be even more physical than, uh, than before. But underwater, they are neutral, and when we showed that day, we were happily surprised that the flow had gone down, the visibility had improved to about half a meter, which seems still very little, but if you can see your hands, and you can see the rock where to tie off the line. Uh, believe me, it, it helps your confidence to advance. So we followed the line of the Navy SEALs and when I realized we were on the way back, it's okay, this is the point where we need to change direction. We clipped on the back the line on the rope and a common mistake is that the divers want to stay shallow against uh, the ceiling. That's also where you have a chance to bump into the roof and, uh, and the visibility is not as good. So I said chose to drop down to the bottom where the visibility was a little bit better and I could follow the gravel. We do the climbing underwater, first 50 meters. Then the cave is become a little bit wider. We start to spend less of the energy and the less exhausted. After like 100 meters, we find the first air pocket, whereas we can stop and discuss what we do. We continue, not continue. But for this 100 meter, we spend like 40 minutes. It's a lot of time for this distance. I use uh, like half of all my gases for this. It's a very heavy job. And about 40 minutes later, tying off, tying off, getting quite excited now that we're finally getting into the right direction, the line was finished and we had to turn around. In the way back, it was fast and more difficult because the visibility it was completely zero. We don't see nothing because we have all the mood, uh, what we uh, put out. Coming back up in Camp 3, the Navy SEAL is looking at us like, what happened to your, to your line? What happened to the rope? He says, I laid the rope. You lost the rope. He says, no, 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 we laid, it, we laid it all out. It is gone. Navy SEALs is say, yes, OK, you, you give up. Say, no, 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 we do it, all the job. What you do? Uh, we do 200 meters of the line. We install the line for you. And they, they sort of didn't understand until I drew it and says, the heading is 255 degrees. And they had a military map that says, that's correct. It is the right direction. And immediately one of the Navy SEALs called with a field telephone to bring the good news. And then everything changed very quickly. This moment, we are motivated all the Navy for Yes, we can continue, we can do something. Because at this moment, no anybody try to, to push it through this chamber street. We were cheered on, but um, I was already happy that I could change the mood in the group. And there was hope, again, that we could uh, actually find those kids. So. Then 
we supposed to go back again on our early Monday morning at 7 a.m. That's when Rick and John and Robert came to our tent for the third time, basically, because uh, the last time that uh, I saw them inside the cave was on Friday morning. And then uh, Friday afternoon, Saturday, the whole Sunday, we, we haven't seen them. And then uh, they coming back up and, and uh, asking them how is our progress. And Ben told them that we, we were able to penetrate and lay the guy line almost to the T-junction. So that's when Rick and John start going in and helping laying down the line. On the 2nd July, uh, we received the permission from Navy to continue the exploration. And by our information, the ropes is was installed until the T-junction. But uh, no anybody can find the way to the Pattaya Beach. Ben and Maxim was the first one that was supposed to continue from the T-junction and continue laying the line all the way through. The whole team went in. Maxim, Seva and myself uh, made it to Camp 3. And this time we took again two big bags of rope. Uh, Maxim this time also took four cylinders. He was actually hoping to get one of the military rebreeders, which would have been very helpful. But. Uh, I don't get the permission and I need to continue to dive with the, with the air, with the diving tank. So we started diving again. Now at this stage we've been going for quite a few hours and Maxim is getting a bit low on his gas supplies and I see we come into a, a bit of a larger room and the green nylon rope goes to a, a bit of a side passage so I decide to follow it, clip on new red line, push the bag in front of me and uh, go through the passage. And the passage is about 50 meters long. And as I'm sort of halfway, I'm like, the thing is getting very easy now. Ben is was first, and he's followed the line what is light before. But one moment I feel the current, is outgoing current, but it suck Ben in the holes. And I follow him. After 20, 30 meters, the restriction was so small. For me, with four tanks, it's well difficult to continue. I realized too late that the finning was getting a bit too easy. I was actually going with the flow and the passage went smaller and smaller until I saw a hole barely enough to fit me through. At that point, I realized I was being sucked in at a pretty high speed. And suddenly I had this recall of the Thai Navy SEALs who had told me that before the cave had flooded, they tried this passage and they were sucked into a really, really small restriction and they barely got it out alive. And I thought to myself, and you are next. Because the T-junction goes left to Pattaya Beach, where the kids are, and right it goes to Monk Series, which uh, is a downstream passage and nobody knows where it ends up, probably in Burma. So I saw this horror story unfolding in front of my eyes, being spit out in a river somewhere in the jungle of Burma, if I wouldn't drown. So I let go of the rope, wedged myself with elbows and knees, trying to stop myself from being sucked in. I tried to go backwards, no chance. And now what? And uh, I'm already afraid for myself, because I'm also not a slim guy with the four tanks, and it's difficult to me to crawl in. I already put two tanks in the back, and climbing and put in the back like this, I'm, I become more smaller. But one moment as I stop, stop I, I cannot continue this way. And I stop the bend and I tell him, push a little bit and say him, we come back. But it don't, it's not, uh, don't ask for me. He say, anyway, he will not continue without me. And suddenly I felt a tug on my fin, tug on my other fin and a sharp pull, another sharp pull, and I moved an inch backwards, and another inch backwards, and another inch. I'm close to be stuck, it was stuck, it. and uh, I cannot turn, I cannot swim back. I just a little bit move with the fins for back and pull the ropes, and uh, I try to don't uh, lose the contact with the bend. I push a little bit myself, like five centimeters, uh, is go, and push back bend push me 
push band, push me, push band. And the next 15 minutes were spent inching 50 meters back out of restriction. Basically, Maxim was pulling me back out of that restriction. And uh, yeah, so suddenly I was extremely happy I wasn't by myself. And because nobody would know, I would disappear in that hole and that would be the end of Ben. <laughs> this is the way of the Ben is do, is continue, is continue, is continue, is never stop. And uh, my decision to go back because I'm afraid for myself, we can say, save uh, his life. So we come back in that main room. Uh, I'm giggling, of course, as the adrenaline wears off. There's an air pocket to be talking to each other. And like, wow, this was close call. Maximus Rise, yeah, why are you going this direction? At this time, yeah, was, we are completely exhausted. We take a few minutes of uh, rest. We have a small briefing, what we do, how we continue. Seems like, well, I had to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm past my reserves. We need to turn around. Yes, we need to turn around. But Maxima has still one bag of red rope. It would be a shame if we turn around and not with his, with his bag. He says, listen, my rebreather can still, still has a few hours on it. And then I realized that I'd actually lost my, my light, my hands. The light on my, my hand was, was missing. And they say, wait uh, one minute, I go to see my light and I come back. And I drop down in the muddy water. And as I drop to the bottom, I can actually see it quite clearly. Now, at that point, everybody had failed to find that passage. And uh, when it's come back, surprised, they say, I found, I found the passage. Is sure it's, uh, it will be this passage. We, don't, we need to attach the ropes and go this way. He says, well, we still have that one bag. She says, shall I try? He says, OK, give me 20 minutes. I go 10 minutes in, 10 minutes out. Doesn't work, that's it. We call it a day. OK, so Max stayed in the air pocket to conserve his, his gas. I clipped the line on and uh, dropped down. And we're like, we found the passage. Now, little did I know that I had clipped my line in on a loose line. So as I'm pulling this forward, my clip, I just slid off the loose end of line. I see the carabine who is slicing and it's go. I catch this carabine and attach properly to other ropes. And then I follow Ben. Now, I didn't know he was following me, so I just kept pushing that bag, thinking time is ticking. So I kept pushing, pushing, and I'm like getting very excited now because I knew once I'm through the restriction, he would go up to Pattaya Beach, which we thought the kids were. So this time the adrenaline was the good adrenaline. Yeah, you have, you have the good stress and the bad stress. This was the good stress, like, hey, we are getting the chances of, of getting there. It's, it's becoming very realistic now. So I'm pushing, 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 not taking any close look to the bag. It was slowly getting flatter and flatter. Just when the cave was getting shallower and shallower, I was already at three meters of depth. I'm like, if I surface here, that's it. We, we reach our goal. And then the next minute, big disappointment. I have the end of the line in my hands and not even close. So anyway, I was already happy with what we achieved. I tied off, turned around, and I saw some light and I went around a little ledge and I surfaced in what was an air pocket and I saw lights and so I'm like are these the kids or, or what so I'm like hello and I hear Max reply Ben yeah, I lost you. You, you 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 lost the line you attach it to the to the wrong ropes who is not was not attached so we said hey we need to come back because Max is through his reserves, and we don't want to jeopardize our, our safety. So um, we also run out of line, but the cave diver always carries extra lines. So we could have proceeded uh, with smaller line and come back the next day for thick line. But um, uh, I guess if Max would have had a rebreather, which sort of was promised to him, uh, and he also prepared the, the military rebreathers, probably would have found the kids. Rebreathers are giving me possibility to have like four or five hours of the autonomy. And with the diving the tank, I have only two hours. It's double or triple. And yes. In the way back, the visibility is was zero because like with the current, all the mood, what is in the water, like disaster, you cannot see nothing, only touch contact and uh, 
and with the current we follow the ropes. In the ejection, we don't put the cookie. Cookie is like marker from which way we go, which way where is the exit, and there we make a decision. Okay, we go there. Sure, I don't know. <laughs> We've come all this way. We can't afford swimming in the wrong direction. Max does not have enough gas. I'm on a rebreather. I can survive another three, four hours, but he can't. And I felt so guilty and responsible that I had not placed a mark, even if it's just a little clip or something to indicate this was the way out. But we are sure it's good direction. In the chamber three, when we make a surface, and first who I see is was the English divers. I was every day to the entrance of the cave or diving in the cave. And during these three, four days, I never see the English people diving and uh, lay the line or help the Navy. Navy SEALs were there, and of course, it's, it's very nice to bring good news. And what do we see? The two British divers who had heard of our progress and had come back. How'd you do? Says, well, we went past the T-Junction. Like, wow, that's, uh, that's really good. He says, yeah, I think we're almost there. It can't be far. Yes, to find the passage from T-Junction to Pattaya Beach, it was like a critical point. And then make briefing with them. How is the way? How is the rope? How we can go and, and uh, continue? So ben, ben and Maxim was the, the first group that continue connecting the Kai Lai from the T-junction, pass through the T-junction, all the way to another 200 meters, almost to the uh, Pattaya Beach. So it looks like it took like maybe one more dive to get to the kids. And now it's really time to, to have a beer and says, hey, this, suddenly we were confident again that we would get to the place where we're supposed to be. At that time, we were uh, resting at the resort. You know, everybody saying, this is it. We have really good feeling about this. And then maybe an hour later. Pei asked for, for quietness, like, uh, because he received a phone call from the commander. And I up and he confirmed, confirmed, yes, yes. It's like, guys, you're not going to believe this. How, how many of you? 13. Brilliant. Many people are coming. Many, many people. We are the first. You have been here 10 days. You are very strong. They found the kids. And it was like, wow, miracles do happen. That all of them were alive. And it was just, I mean, it was, you could hear everybody screaming and yelling. Because before that, it was just uh, up in the clouds, in an imaginary uh, uh, football team. Uh, it wasn't until I saw the actual footage that it was check in my head. Yes, they are alive and they are healthy and they are because I had imagined that at least some of them would have diseased or, or be very ill or they would have gone mad. And imagine being stuck for 10 days, no food, no light, in a cave, uh, sitting on, on a pile of guano, batshit, to be honest. So everybody cheers and right away, Maxim, bring out the vodka, <laughs> Let, let's celebrate, right? But I, I remember because Ben said, hey, wait, 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 our job is not done yet. Let's get ready and go back up to the, to the cave side and, and, you know, they might need our help. So the first thing we did, we packed our stuff, got in the van, went down to the, the tent. We were in with the Navy SEALs and stuff like that. Yes, everybody already celebrated. Yes, the child is alive, he, he's still there, he's not far from Pattaya Beach. Everything is okay, the Navy SEALs is with them. And as we arrived there, the British just came out and we said, wow, oh, guys, congratulations, awesome jobs. Well, awesome job laying the line. They, they told back in, they were hauled off to the press room. Of course, all the focus went uh, to the British, uh, but still, Emil came to me and gave me a hug saying, we will never forget all the hard work that you, you guys have done, laying out the red carpet, as he would uh, say. Funny, because it was actually red rope as well. And uh, you had to see this very highly decorated military person give you a hug was, uh, was pretty, Good feeling. It was really funny, as Ben said. I never get a high five from the admiral or something like that. It was like, whoa. Really, everybody happy, surprised. It's motivated 
everybody to to push again. Is the hope is become reality. All together, we can continue. We can do the good job and uh, and save these kids. After the press sort of left the British alone, I, um, I went up to the British and uh, say, "Hey guys, good job. No, it's well done." But now the hard work starts. John Volunteer looks at me like, "I mean, says, well, we need to get get the kids out." I have back in my shop in Phuket. I have um, full face masks, and, and at least we can try. Turns around to me and says, uh, "Ben, you don't make any sense." The Ben is asked who is do what, because we see him dive after us. No, how many line is this style? What is do? But he's don't answer for Ben and say, "No, no, Ben, it's better if you go. Don't give any information for us." Maybe you better leave until just leave because you don't make any sense at all. And that was us smacking the face. And then after kids were found, we were not allowed to dive anymore because me and Maxine proposed, hey, shall we go and bring food? And, and I guess it's nice for the kids if they see faces show up so, uh, while waiting. And for uh, next day too, uh, and this moment we decide uh, if it's enough our help at this moment. Uh, I prefer to back to, to my life, to my work, and uh, because I cannot spend uh, the time for, 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 uh, for nothing. We, we decided um, to shake hand and uh, have our second team continue to do the rescue effort. And then the Ben and Silva and Maxim, myself, go back to, to work, basically, because we've been away from work for, for so long. And so all of our team were sort of sidelined, and, and out of frustration, we, we left. We left. Uh, when I came back from Philippines and was on site, I wasn't allowed to dive. Uh, both John and Rick passed by me and said hi, and they didn't even talk to me. So, and that's when I started thinking, out, like, something doesn't add up here. Something. And I started thinking, was it them that, that are blocking my entrance into the cave, or, or not? I went to the admiral. He looks at me and says, Ben, you're on our, on our team. We are one team. And I realized. There is the Navy SEALs, and there is the British. Oxygen had to be pumped in tanks and hauled into caves for the kids for the full face masks. So in the end, me staying outside, there has to be a, a reason for this. And I was the only one who knew how to operate this pump, because all the rest, all the other divers were inside. Probably a, a good thing with a bad thing. One of my proudest moments when, was when I was pushed in, in line with uh, the special forces. When we were going in for the push, uh, an admiral says, get in line because you're part of our team. He gave me a T-shirt, I received one of the, the, the blessed beats by the monks. I was very proud that suddenly I'm, I'm part of the Navy SEAL team. The Navy SEALs, my experience, is great guys, a good discipline, ready to sacrifice his life for the mission hard-working people, good execution of all the orders, and uh, very strong guys. I'm very appreciate. The Navy SEALs walked right up to me, took my hat off, take his hat, put it on my head, and we embraced, we shake hand, and I feel really honored because one of the SEALs just embraced me of their own team. The Navy SEALs, they were some of the best, the best of what they do. When it comes to cave diving, we have a little bit more experience than them, but that was what we were there for to do, was to help them, to support them, because they were leading the operation. For me, cave diving is my job. I'm every month in caves, in bad visibility conditions and stuff, so, and I know how daunting it was for me and Maxim and all the other rest, that this is a really dangerous situation, and we are used to it. It's our job. These guys, not. These guys had never been inside a cave, and still to go, like that, jumping in this whirlpool of mud, that takes some serious bravery. And, uh, knowing that you might not make it out, uh, I think that's hats off to these guys. Each day they brought out four kids. So three days, four kids, four kids, 
and the last day the four kids in the, the soccer coach. When the last kids, uh, last team is go out, it was a really effort. The, we make a party, yes, then okay, we can sleep normally. We can back to normal life and uh, and forget about all this. Again, it was the team effort, a little bit of luck, and positive mindset, and. Um, I think that's what uh, we should all learn, that uh, yeah, if everybody comes together and everybody does it from the good side of the heart, a lot of things can be achieved. And actually, I never actually got to see the kids. The first time that I actually got to see the kids were at the ceremony. I was just surprised at how small they were. <laughs> a few months after, I get a letter uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You have to come to, um, to Bangkok and uh, there's a, an official celebration at the palace. And we were flown there, and next minute we're in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the police escort brought to the palace, and it's all the Thai Navy SEALs in a beautiful white suit, gold, and I didn't even recognize half the guys because, of course, being in a wetsuit in the cave it was amazing. I'd never seen any any setup like that. I'd never been to the palace before. And uh, it says, "Who's coming? Prime Minister is coming and going to hand you a decoration on behalf of the king." And that's when I got, again, a little bit nervous, you know. And in walks the Prime Minister and got a proper medal. Like, I've never even served in the military, so... I was given a fifth-class award from the Prime Minister, obviously, you know, coming from the King and stuff like that, for the cave rescue. It's not what you do it for. Yeah, if you turn up as a volunteer or charity, you shouldn't expect a medal or a reward or something. I mean, of course, everybody likes recognition, which I definitely got from the Thai people. It's, uh, at some point, there was mentioned that we laid the line under the leadership of the British, which is actually not correct, because both Max and I and some people, we did risk our life to, to lay that line, to pave the path. In any situation, I am happy, because we have a result, and good result. I do 700 meter or 200 meters or 20 meters, if this can get closer to, to the real result what we get, to find the kids, I'm always happy. I don't need to, nothing from this. The result is more important. Do I want to, would I, would I do things differently or would I, no, I don't think so. I mean, the way things were done made that it was a success. And, and is ego involved? Of course, there's always ego involved. Everybody wants to be a champion, but uh, and I'm already happy with our performance that we laid the line. And then being blocked from going in, of course, it was frustrating. And but what to do? The objective has been reached. And I think that's what we need to focus on and not take away the, the glamour of the entire. Because it is a fantastic story in the end. Yeah, Hollywood would not come up with such a story. So I think it's, and it's real. The kids are real, they're out alive and healthy. I think that's the main message to take away. When all hope is lost, it's remarkable men that make a difference, that succeed where others have failed. Our divers who risked everything to enter the cave system and lay the lines that directly led to the soccer team and their coach motivated the international rescue effort to keep pushing forward with renewed hope. The British divers who ultimately found the kids enjoyed worldwide fame and appreciation, while those who guided their way were swept aside. In nearly every epic story, there are heroes who stood on the shoulders of others to achieve the impossible. It is to these others, the unsung heroes, that we dedicate this film. They show us the true meaning of courage, 
the willingness to give everything while demanding nothing. Their actions, often unknown and uncredited, continue to be a quiet inspiration to us all. The story about the Tam Luang cave is it's a very interesting one. I basically learned afterwards. The legend goes that it's a reclining lady that uh, was cursed and became stone into a mountain. A woman born in Chiang Rai, one night she, she had a dream after the kids were in the cave. And the dream was that the woman had come to her and say, I will release the kids if Pra Kuba a famous monk connected to the cave would come and give his blessings and then she would release the kids out of her womb but she might take a man a sacrifice and somehow it's the story got to Prakuba, a monk who does a lot of retreats in the forest this time he was in Myanmar he had heard about this and he actually walked to the cave say I'm here to meditate trying to get the kids out and so he meditated and strangely enough he did predict the day the kids would be found. He also did predict when the first kid would be brought out. Of course, adds flavor to the story. The scary and probably a bit more upsetting part is that she did take one sacrifice. As we all know, Saman didn't make it out of the cave alive, but the kids were released, so... It's scary how the story actually, the legend, fell into place. Obviously, this area in Chiang Rai, there's a lot of farmers that love stories like this, and it added to the flavor, but did it help to the general hope and praying and positive flux towards the rescue? I don't mind, but it did help. <laughs>